my name is uh, Christine Wendo Obago Sadia. Long names though. I'm the current uh, national chairperson of Kenya Medical Women's Association, an association that was founded in 1983 by 12 very amazing women. I was mentored to be one of the founder when I was very young. As many board uh, chairpersons, this is a registered NGO being regulated by the NGO Coordination Board. As many of the board chairs, the work is simply supposed to be very easy. Just coming to chair, maybe board meetings, if you find that uh, uh, you are a board chair that just likes sharing, sharing meeting and going away. But as I found myself as a chair, and that currently we don't have a CEO on board, therefore that means that I interface a little between the chair and also ensuring that things at the secretariat is working well. Kemwa in full is Kenya Medical Women's Association who were privileged then as a young doctor like myself. Now these great women, one of them was the first woman doctor in this country, Dr. Jane Miano was one. One is also a very renowned woman, a Professor Dr. Maria Mwere, I'm sure her name is all over. And of the first president for the Africa Region of Medical Women's Association, Dr. Florence Manguyo. So they first found it fit to uh, found an outfit where women doctors would be because the challenges of women doctors then were very many. One, they had unique issues of their own as women, but also as doctors. It's a very challenging position. One, we were not attracting very many young uh, upcoming uh, people to come to the medical school. So where's the issue of creating an awareness in schools so that we can attract girls to come to the uh, practice of medicine. The next was to mentor the likes like of ourselves so that we could uh, aspire to greater areas of health that had not been penetrated by women. So that was one. The next was the objective to reach out to women's health and champion and advocate for women's health. Why was this so? This was so because women were more or less the inequality in provision and access of healthcare towards women and focusing on women specific issues then prompted us to form an outfit that could address those issues. And that's why Kemo was formed. Myself, my background is very simple. Born in Nairobi, in the earlier stages in uh, Makongeni, in Nairobi. Father died. My mother, who would never went to school, her, her job in Nairobi is finished because she has nothing to do. So we are all repatriated like families. Those days, the railway people will give you a bus with all your belongings. You go home, you bury, you stay there. So mom relocated from here to the rural home. So when we went to our rural home in Siaya County, so that's where I started my schooling. I started my schooling because when dad died, I was very young. So I started schooling there. Mom grew, growing pamba, you know, that those days the cotton growing was still very hot in, in Nyanza. So mom grew, um, was tilling the land and making pamba. That was the cash crop that took us to school. So I went to a school called Saradidi Primary School. That's where I started. But before Saradidi, I was fortunate enough that my mom had linked up with another lady who then started a nursery kind of a school within a compound and then to the church. So when, I, when mom went home, the only place that she could find an environment of solace and mom was a faith person already as we were living here, was, was the church. So we were all nurtured in church. That was our life. You go to catechism, you could do things of how the villagers do things in the church. But going to school, mom was very proud of uh, schooling. So she ensured that all her children went to school. I went through my education until I finished my CPE. Then I went to Rangala Girls where I also did very well and excelled. I think one of the top in science classes. I think one of the 
few, either one alone or two, we got first division, then went to Nakuru High School where I also did the sciences, and eventually came to the University of Nairobi where I started uh, dentistry. But growing up at home was interesting. I used to look after my siblings. You are a maid at the same time, you provide, you do things, the home chores. At the same time, there, I remember vividly one of my cousins had married, but she was now coming. The mother was, uh, the mother, my mom and her mom are sisters. So mom insisted that she had to be brought back to do CPE because she got married before she did. So I remember this occasion when she was doing her CPE. I was in the school literally carrying the baby while she's in the class doing CPE. I am passionate about uh, doing what I do because of my upbringing. And I have a mother who was a mentor. Mom would not put a coin to whatever that she was passionate about and she wanted to do. And I'm also being grown on a, humani on a voluntary organization. One that I love most is the Kenya Girl Guides Association, where I grew to be, I think even the standard serialized this, I was the chief commissioner at some point in 2009 and left later. But I was brought up in a, of, in a situation of giving back to society. So when I found Kemu I was looking after the less privileged, I found it very useful for me to fit in in where you are giving back, you are supporting the other to grow, you are not growing alone, you are growing as a community. You remember those days children were not a family's child, we were communal children. I remember vividly if you played around on the roadside and somebody found you, another mother found you, you will be kind and nobody will will be upset about some other mother or a father reprimanding you. Because when you go home, in fact, it is one thing you would like to hide from your parents. Because if they hear, then they will definitely know you are doing something which was not right, and you are okay, and you will get, your mom will give you more cane so that you get out of mischief. So I think that is what brought me to this point. Well, the bomb blast was a unique experience for all of us doctors and uh, for Kenyans. And when I was thrown at the deep end of the bomb blast, I think it came naturally. It wasn't because I was the best to do it, but because of the events of that day. When the bomb blast uh, went up, we were with the World Bank team and the permanent secretary in a boardroom. And I remember me ordering everybody out like that, I looked out of the window, I saw the smoke, and I told the PS, close the meeting. This is not an ordinary event. This is a bomb blast. Why did I say so? It found when I'd already served in Rwanda genocide, I'd already been in places of conflict, providing my voluntary support to the church. This time I was working for, I'd already worked for all Africa Conference of Churches. And therefore it came to me very naturally because I'd been in Central Africa Republic where bombs used to go up. And I realized that this was not an ordinary gun. It looked like a bomb blast. So I started ordering a few things for people to do things. Double glove yourself, start whatever, we are receiving this. Please uh, assign this, this and this. And I, because I'd worked in Kenyatta National Hospital, I knew there was a room, I think it was 40 or 42, which we had designated as an open room for managing disasters or huge event. So I asked, why can't the room be opened for people to go? But as a casualty, I found myself putting drip, which had left for a very long time. This particular vivid event was that there was a vehicle that had been hit that were carrying young children with the I think there is a, was a, a nation school with Asian children breeding profusely. So I found myself trying to put drip or putting drip and getting people. And all of a sudden I found myself calling a KBC to tell that all the leave of everybody has been cancelled if you are in the environment of Nairobi from up to Kiambu. You report to Kenyatta office. All leaves have been suspended. I used CAP 242, which is the public health act, without any authority. So I guess my involvement at the casualty, I then became a natural 
I think somebody to be coordinated. So when this pronouncement the following day came that I would be leading the bomb blast as a coordinator, well, it surprised me, but it's something that what we sorted out at Kenyatta that day, because by four o'clock, everybody was here. Either in theater, we converted the outpatient clinic, we closed it, we converted every space we could for a theater, and therefore we were busy operating. And then when the pronouncement came the following day that I was a, I was a bomb blast coordinator, now the mandate was that I go to private sector, find everything, and the filing report to office of the president by 10 every day. So it was a tough job, but it's a job that we cracked. Kenyans really came out to give us goodwill to what do you want? I was touched because a woman from Kibera would walk and say, can this dress help somebody? So they even used to bring their clothes, were tattered clothes. They, they just wanted to support. Can I donate blood? Some would say, you can't, you don't have enough. So it was, a very, it was a very moving moment for me where Kenyans came together in their usual spirit of Arambe to support. We even found that we were being served with hot food. The Asian community brought in a lot of hot food, biryani. The healthcare providers never lacked anything to take water. Just started pouring mattresses coming to the place. So it was a moment that I still remember that Kenyans rallied themselves in an event that they did not even know how to manage. But like I said, God prepares you. Well, I still feel that I have a lot to do. I haven't reached my peak of my legacy. I have a few uh, successes that I could attribute to the work that I've done so far. When mentoring girls, ensuring that the um, uh, what needs to be done in the women's field I, and uh, maybe I would want to go back a little bit. I was mentored by the likes of the women's movement in Kenya. The women's movement in Kenya in the 80s was very great and I think that what inspired me the most. You are not only reaching in your area of expertise but together with the Wangari Mathai, the Green Belt movements, Kenya Kemwa was there as the vice chair, Dr. Onyanga Kena was the vice chair. I served as the treasurer of the National Council of Women of Kenya, which was a, an umbrella body for all women NGOs in Kenya. And those were moments that helped us to advocate for policy issues and look at the equality, the gender equality, but particularly the equality of women, how the insubordination of women would be addressed, how the issues of access to women in various spaces, whether it was agriculture, peace movement. But one of these that helped me, that I remember vividly, that I was one of those that, was, uh, that wrote the piece of paper that founded what we now call the gender, uh, either the gender commission or the gender ministry. That time there was nothing like that that was existed. Women's affairs were within the Ministry of Youth, Women and whatever land. But I remember with Alice and Shelaite as the assistant minister with Balala, we sat day and night on a computer in my room. She would come to my room and would write a paper which eventually gave uh, rise to the women's uh, desk. It started women, women's desk and uh, the government gave us five million then and uh, Alison Chelaite, the assistant minister, then I went out of the country but when I came we now had a gender commission, we now had a ministry of gender. So that is a moment that I know I've contributed uh, very briefly but um, it's something that I'm always proud of. I'm always also proud of the women, young women doctors, who are very, uh, very right now their IQs is above beyond what ourselves would have done, and they have a lot of uh, technology. They are, they know the globe, they know their work, they are more passionate, and they can do many things. So those ladies inspire me. What I still regret is that women doctors or women in medicine have not adequately. Uh, permeated the policy making bodies, they are not yet on the table to decide the health of either Kenyans or the health of women. Some are there, but I think it's something that women need to be on the table much more. They bring the passion of a mother, 
so they can touch with the healing of a mother apart from the healing of of what we do as medicine but i think with their gut feeling of being a mother and embracing uh, and nurturing the people that they have given birth to whether boys or girls i think they should be given more spaces to speak and to shape the policy of this nation well i must say that all through my career the life work balance either falls in automatically but for myself i would say when i worked as the senior deputy director of medical services even even before i reached there leave was not something that was out of my window each time i would request for leave i would be told there's an agenda you need to do either the moi day which was successfully organized i would work day and night more or less sometimes there was mornings that my husband would fetch me in the office at 8 or at 2 a.m. to go and rest a bit and and recharge and come back but i'm not regretting because i did not drop the ball of being a mother and ensuring that my children grow up with certain discipline certain values of the family and i i carry a long value from my family where i'm born and where i'm married um incidentally it surprises people that are married to a muslim so i have both sometimes you would find me walking to the office with a buibui because i knew in the evening we will have an islamic function then that demanded that i conform to the islamic faith and dress like I, they would like me appropriately to be that has been documented by dochuela because i've also promoted when i was in all africa conference of churches the interfaith living the muslim Hindu and Christian religion so we started Prokmora so Prokmora is a movement that I have I still cherish up today because I believe irrespective of your faith you should still be able to be human beings and work together and achieve things together I love my grandchildren I have three I have three beautiful children I have two daughters the first two one I lost at the delivery which we can talk about in maternal health issues how they should be managed but my last born is the only son and the last one and i love my children my second daughter has two children boys and let me tell you those grandchildren of mine if i put a, like a, a, a bright um, cute x or i put a color in my nails they will be the first one to shout granny we like this and every single moment before they sleep i have a chat with my grandchildren they don't live here but i think that is the only thing that a gift that i can give them to ensure that their children are emo- her children are emo- emotionally balanced mm-hmm. so i have a few moments to talk with them face time and just finding how their days were i guess being for your family even if it is short let it be quality time for family i can't claim that i've been with my family all the time with the, all the things i do but the little moment i get i give them quality time so that's something that i think also i would like to encourage that in this pandemic when we are seeing young girls the foundation that the families give to the children is what is going to carry them through in this very cruel world well the challenges are quite many very many I from the time I said that I was an orphan father went mom remained alone she never went to school so challenges with school education were, were there from the time that I've uh, uh, I've had my life I've never had it smooth I can't say that there's a moment that I would uh, feel that life is just a bed of roses yeah workplaces I have issues with uh, You see when you also to um one thing that I want to say that if you stand for the truth and you can't be com- you can't compromise your values and this is what is bringing my challenges are basically from the values that I've ascribed to myself there are certain things that I cannot do there are certain things that are no go zone for me yeah like if you want me to do something that I think is going to be like a violation of somebody's right or i think it would be a violation of an institution of like taking something that belongs to people that a, a collective that should benefit from it that i will not do if also you want maybe me to get into a program which i think 
that uh, my I'm seeing certain things that I don't like. So I am ready to tell you I can back off even if I'm seeing financial gain out of it. I'm ready to back off very quickly and say, please try another person. When I do my consultancies, which I do a lot, not in Kenya, but globally, and if I think there's something undertone which is going not to bring um, ethics, and I look at ethics. Like for example, I'll give one. I was supposed to do some consultancy which was bringing nutrition to Africa. But then when I realized that the food was laced with something uh, that would maybe jeopardize the lives of people. And I say, I can't push that agenda. I cannot give you a paper to that respect. So even I started the consultant already, but I said, no, it's okay. I'll stop my consultancy if you want to pay me for the weight. If you don't, good enough. So I'm very, uh, my challenges are emanating mainly from the workplace and the ethics and the values that I've ascribed to my person and to the environment where I work. But also I get a lot of gratitude because I get a few that also conform to that school of thought that I am in. Those who work very well and globally I have many friends and networks of people, even here in Kenya. Transparency, accountability, making sure that fairness and justice is being done. And I am very ready to say sorry even to the cleaners when I think that I have uh, offended one. So those are values that I have for myself. Uh, other things are things like, you're supposed to do this, your superior tells you do this. And you find that it is going to violate somebody. I say no. One time I was removed from Ministry of Health without any warning. I was thrown to Kiambu where I was reporting to a junior. I did, and eventually the Lord opened another way. I went to the UN. So I've been having challenges, but I can say there are challenges that open for me opportunities. Yeah. So I'm not regretting those challenges because they have opened for me greater opportunities. What you see as a challenge today may be your greatest, if maybe your greatest uh, uh, place where you reap. See, when somebody says, if you get a lemon, make it a lemonade. Yes, where I found a challenge of my job has been terminated, maybe unfairly because people have gone to say things about whatever. The next few months, or I will stay, yes, drive for I remember, I recall staying somewhere without a job for about, when I left South Africa, for about three years. I was in my house in Kileleshwa. Something came from European Union on an email, and I did it successfully, and that opened for me the doors. I went back to the UN in Ethiopia where I have now retired and come back home. Every single day you wake up, you will get a challenge or two. But it is the way you manage it, it is the way that you take it. So how do we manage challenges? Not to be defeatist, and Kenya and Kenya Girl Guide Association grown me to be. You know you have to be reliant, you have to be assertive, but you have to be a go-getter as well. But in your go-getting, Prioritize which is the best route out for you. Look out for what that may be. They are downfall, avoid them. Look for a way that you can surmount it and come out victorious. But it also means that you have to arm yourself with a few confident that you can ask. Not those that cheat you and want you your downfall, but proven and tested confidence that when you pick a phone and say, This is my challenge. The other will tell you, breathe in, breathe out, wait, I will call you once I've figured it out. And sure enough, they will call you, they will not leave you in your greatest point of need. That's what I've learned and what, that is what I give to the others as well.